looking out their back window where her son and her two nephews were playing. And as she's watching them, one of her nephews named Harrison walked over to this tree and began peeling the bark off of the tree. And for Jen, this brought back a very strange childhood memory that she hadn't thought about in decades. And without meaning to actually say the words out loud, Jen kind of blurted out what was going through her head, which was so weird. And her mother, who was in the other room, heard her say that and she yells into the room, hey Jen, is everything okay? What's so weird? And Jen, feeling a little bit embarrassed that she just said that out loud and that her mom heard her, is quick to try to dismiss it by saying, oh no, sorry, it's nothing, I didn't mean to say that. But as she's trying to dismiss it, her mom had walked into the living room where Jen was and saw Jen was looking out the back window towards the boys. And so her mom walked right up next to Jen and goes, what are the boys doing out there that's so weird? Are they doing something they shouldn't be doing? And Jen's like, no, no, it, it, has, it has nothing to do with the kids. I, I just saw Harrison who was doing something that reminded me of some weird thing that happened to me and I blurted out my reaction to it, that's all. And Jen's mom looks at her and says, well, now you gotta tell me the memory because I'm totally intrigued. Jen says, okay, mom, I'll tell you the story. I don't know if Frankie's mom ever told you this or not, but when I was eight years old, I spoke to Frankie and he was doing some homework and he told me to come meet him outside of his house and that when he was done, we could meet up and go play together. And so I walked over to his house and I was standing across the street in front of that small group of trees that we called the Pinecone Forest, even though it was just a handful of trees, but we all called it that. Anyways, I was standing over there and I was just kind of mindlessly peeling the bark off of the tree. I don't even remember consciously deciding to do it. And so as I'm peeling the bark off the tree, watching Frankie's house, waiting for him to come outside, I notice to my right, there's this guy walking through the forest towards me. And I look at him and I've never seen him before. And before he got even within 10 feet of me, I could smell cigarettes. He reeked of cigarettes and his teeth were very yellow. He's missing a number of teeth. And I noticed right away when I looked at his hands, I don't know why I was looking at his hands, but I looked at his hands and he had these pointy yellow fingernails that almost looked like he was intentionally growing them out to be long and jagged. And he comes walking up to me and stops completely in my personal space. And instead of looking at me, he looks at the spot on the tree where I had been peeling the bark off. And he's literally like one foot away from me, so close that I had to lean back because I didn't want to be rude and run away. So I'm leaning back to avoid being right next to this guy. And all I can smell is cigarette smoke. And he turns from the tree to me and he goes, what do you think you're doing? And I'm like this and I'm like, uh, I'm waiting for my friend. And he says, no, what are you doing to the tree? And I remember looking at him and then the tree and saying, peeling the bark off. And that's when he raised his hand up and pinched my arm with his nails, not with the pads of his fingers, but he was using his nails and he's pinching down on my skin and through gritted teeth, he says, how would you like it if someone peeled your skin off? I remember as he's pinching me, I was so terrified that I didn't do anything. I was like in a trance and just stood there looking at him, wondering what's about to happen. And then as luck would have it, Frankie's mom just happened to come outside and yelled, hey, come on inside, Frankie's done with his homework. And so that kind of broke me out of my trance. I pulled my arm away and I began running away from him across the street towards Frankie's house. And I turned around once, kind of expecting him to be chasing me, but he wasn't. He was still standing next to the tree that I had pulled the bark off of, except now he was watching me. And I ran up onto the porch and ran inside. And that was that. I remember wanting to tell you about it when I got home, but for some reason I didn't. And then days turned into weeks, turned into months, and before long it was just a distant memory and I never really thought about it and at some point did forget about it until just now when I saw Harrison peeling the bark off of the tree and it, it brought it back and that's why you heard me say, so weird. That was my reaction to it because I'm wondering, who was that guy and, and what happened to him? Like, that's so creepy. After Jen told her mother the story, she was expecting her mom to be a little bit horrified by it because it is a pretty startling story about her own child. But Jen's thinking it's been so long since this happened and nothing came of it that her mom would probably quickly move on from it. But Jen noticed her mom looked very concerned and she turned to her and she goes, mom, this happened like two decades ago. Like this is not a big deal. And her mom looks down for a second and then looks up and she has this look of, of guilt on her face. And she says to her daughter, Jen, I should have told you this when, when it happened, but it's just, you were so young and, and I, I felt like it was gonna ruin your childhood. And so I just didn't tell you. And it seemed like you forgot about it, but obviously you didn't. And so I, I guess I guess you gotta hear the full story now. Jen's confused at this point and she says, what are you talking about? And her mother, who now looks really uncomfortable, you know, she's touching her face and she looks very anxious. She says to Jen, it's time you learned who that man really was. 
Before Jen could ask any more questions, her mom just says, honey, just sit down and, and I will explain everything to you. So they sit down and Jen's mom is still acting pretty uncomfortable. This is obviously a difficult subject for her. And she starts by saying, okay, so do you remember how in our neighborhood where you grew up, everybody seemed to know each other? You know, it was a, a really tight community of people. And Jen's like, yeah, I remember that. And her mom was like, well, because of that, it made it really easy to spot people that were, you know, outsiders that didn't live in the neighborhood. And so if a car came down the street and I didn't recognize it, I would find myself looking out the window and, and watching the car to see where it was going because there's no reason to be in this neighborhood unless you're a visitor or you live here. And so I was in the habit of people watching anybody that showed up that I didn't recognize. And I know a bunch of the other mothers in the neighborhood did the same thing, one of them being Frankie's mom. Anyways, on the same day that that creep came up to you and pinched your arm when you were eight years old in 1995, well, that morning, Frankie's mom, Sonia, she happened to look out her front window and she saw a vehicle she didn't recognize. And it was a work van, a white work van. It didn't have windows in the back and it was parked across the street near the Pinecone Forest. And so she assumed it must be a work truck and whoever had brought it here was, you know, working on one of the houses in the neighborhood. But where it was parked, it was not close to any one particular house. And there was lots of places you could have parked on the street. So it seemed odd if you're gonna be doing work on a house that you wouldn't just park in front of the house. Like why would you park, you know, inconveniently farther away in front of this random forest. And so that got her thinking that something's up with this fan, but she didn't, she didn't think it was bad. She just was trying to make sense of it. And so all morning she found herself going to the window and looking out to see if someone was gonna claim this van, but she never saw anybody go near it. She didn't see workers going in and out of it. She didn't see any activity that was related to the van. It was just this empty van parked randomly across the street. And by the afternoon, when still no one had claimed this vehicle, she was getting ready to call the police. So that same day, you and Frankie had spoken on the phone and planned to meet up at the Pinecone Forest after he was done with his homework. And he didn't tell his mom about these plans. And so she didn't know that you would be very close to this van. Had she have known that, she would have told you to not wait out there, but instead to come right inside and don't go near this van. So at some point in the afternoon, when Sonia's getting ready to call the police and you were actually already over at the Pinecone Forest waiting for Frankie, Sonia's looking out the window and she sees the back two doors fly open and that guy who pinched you jumps out of the back and starts running into the Pinecone Forest. And from where Sonia's looking, she can only see part of the forest. The other portion of it is to the right that's out of her view through this window. And so she turns and runs in her house to the side window of her house. And she looks out at that section of the Pinecone Forest where this guy has run to. And she sees you standing in front of the tree. And she sees this guy sprint right up to you and sees him pinch you in the arm and he's talking to you. And that's when she ran out onto the porch and yelled for you to come inside. And she would tell me later that when she did that, she tried to sound very natural. She was worried if she sounded like this was an emergency, not only would it frighten you, but it might trigger this stranger to grab you or take you because now he's been made. You know, someone realizes he's a bad guy and he might take you. And so the whole time she's watching you, she was watching him to see if he was gonna chase you. And so when you came inside, she did her best to be totally calm and told you to go play with Frankie. And as soon as you were out of the room, she ran around the house and locked all the doors, all the windows, and then called me. And we decided it made sense to call the police. Even though you were safely in the house, we didn't know who this guy was, and it seemed like he was intentionally targeting you, like he was waiting for you the whole time. And so Sonia calls the police, and a police cruiser was sent over to our neighborhood, and they quickly found the white van that matched the description. They pull up next to it, and they walk to the driver's side, and sitting inside the car is a man that matches the description of what Sonia gave, and he's acting really weird. You know, he looked like he was on drugs, or maybe he was, he was drunk, or something was wrong with him. Something was off about him. And so the officers had him step out of the car and they searched his car and in the front two seats there was nothing but you know cigarette butts and trash and there was a partition wall between the front two seats and the the back workspace of the van they went around to the back of the van and they see this guy has screwed a latch onto the back of the two doors right across the middle and there's a padlock through it so there's an additional lock on this back door clearly he doesn't want anybody getting in the back of this thing. And so the police turned to this guy and they're like, we need to get in the back of your truck. Can you please open this? And at first he was, you know, making excuses why he couldn't open it. But finally he relented and pulled out a special keychain he was carrying that had two distinct keys on it. And he used one of them to undo the padlock. He opened that up and then he swung open the doors and he backed up. 
And the police look inside and they can't believe what they're looking at. Inside of this van, all over every surface in the back, were pictures of you taped to the walls, to the ground, to the back. I mean, everywhere you looked, there was a picture of you. And they weren't just recent pictures of you. There was at least a couple pictures of you when you were six years old and you were eight when he approached you. So we know he was following you for at least two years. Also in the back of the van were binoculars as well as a camera that presumably he was using to take these pictures of you. But that's not even the worst part. After this guy got arrested, one of the officers pulled out that keychain that had the key to the padlock on the back of his van, and he noticed the other key on the keychain was not just a duplicate key to the same padlock. It was a different, unique key. And so the police go over to this guy and they show him the key and they say, what is this to? And he says, it's to my storage locker. And so the police track down a storage locker and they go over there and they unlock the lock with the key and they open the door and what's inside is straight out of a nightmare. The entire storage locker, the ceiling, the floor, the walls, all of it was covered in clear plastic wrap. And behind the plastic wrap, you could see on the walls were hundreds more pictures of you. And in the middle of the storage locker was a dentist chair that had been anchored to the ground. Next to the dentist chair was this silver tray like you would see in a dentist's office, except on it were all these knives. And they were not surgical or medical knives. They were like meat cleavers and hunting knives, crude instruments. And then next to that on a table was an anatomy book where he had used printouts of you to bookmark different parts of the book that he was taking notes on and highlighting all of which had to do with the female anatomy. In the back of the locker was a rotted mattress that was just sitting on the ground and anchored in the back on the wall were chains with handcuffs extending off of them. And then next to the bed were dozens of empty five gallon drums. When the police showed us pictures of the inside of his van, we were very shaken up. It was just so awful to imagine someone taking advantage of you in that way, you know, watching you. But when they showed us pictures of the chamber that he had created inside of his storage locker, that's just something I'll never get over. He clearly had plans for you. After hearing this story from her mother, Jen is a mixture of angry with her mom for not telling her sooner, but also sad, you know, that her mom had to go through that with her child because now Jen is a mother and she can only imagine how horrible that must have been for her then and even still now. And so all Jen could think to do was give her mom a hug. After they embraced, Jen asked her mom, you know, what happened to this guy? You know, where is he? Did he go to jail? And her mom told her that he had confessed to stalking Jen and he confessed that everything they found in the storage locker in his van was his and that he understood the implications, but he never gave his real motives for it or really what his intentions were. He was ultimately put into a high security mental institution for the criminally insane. And her mom said she has no idea if he's still alive or if he's been transferred, but that was the last she knew about him. And so Jen wound up doing some homework and figured out where he was being held. And she asked to have a meeting with him because she wanted to ask him to his face, what were you planning to do to me? I, I wanna know why you did this. And he agreed to take this meeting, but the day before they were supposed to have it, he took his own life. And so Jen doesn't know if that was brought on by their impending meeting. It certainly seems likely, but unfortunately that's it. She doesn't get any more answers and it will end with a big question mark of. Michael DiPolito grew up in a very rough neighborhood in South Philadelphia where violence, drugs, and prostitution were just normal parts of everyday life. At a young age, like his parents, Michael became an alcoholic. He also developed a very serious drug addiction that he paid for by selling drugs. Michael would eventually drop out of high school and not long after that, he became homeless and was living out on the streets, sleeping in abandoned buildings at night to stay warm. In 1993, when Michael was still in South Philadelphia, he was arrested for the first time. He was charged with possession of an unknown drug as well as intent to distribute this unknown drug. Court records don't specify what drug this was. However, Michael just did not show up for court and so a warrant was put out for his arrest. Michael would somehow manage to evade police capture and by 1997, he had fled South Philly altogether and landed in South Florida in a town called Boca Raton. Shortly after arriving there, Michael was arrested for a second time, this time for offering an undercover police officer $15 in exchange for sex. 
Michael would plead guilty to soliciting prostitution. However, he would just get released. A year after the prostitution arrest, Michael was sued by a former girlfriend named Karen Tan, who claimed he was the father of her son, and so he owed her child support. And Karen had a DNA test that backed up this claim. However, Michael, again, would just not show up for court, and before long, Karen just gave up and dropped the lawsuit. Michael was likely very relieved when this happened, because at the time, he was making almost no money through a temp agency. And so after this lawsuit gets dropped, Michael decides, I need to go out and make some real money. And somehow, on his quest to find a more lucrative opportunity, Michael was introduced to associates of the Bonanno family. And the Bonanno family is one of the infamous five families that dominates organized crime across the United States. They are literally the Italian mafia. And after the mafia met Michael, they took a liking to him, and they did did offer him a more lucrative, albeit illegal, opportunity. They gave him a role inside one of their so-called boiler rooms. A boiler room is not literally a boiler room. Instead, it's a group of fraudsters that use high-pressure sales tactics to steal money from unsuspecting victims. Typically, the way it works is the fraudster will cold call someone, and they will tell them that they have this great get-rich-quick scheme, but you got to give me your money right now if you want to be a part of it. And so when the victim says, okay, that sounds great, and they wire the money along, the fraudster just steals their money. Michael, who was very charismatic and a natural salesman, got really good at tricking people into giving him their money. And so eventually, Michael realized he could make a lot more money if he started his own boiler room, where his commission could be much higher on the money he stole. And so fairly abruptly, he left the mafia's boiler room. We don't really know how they reacted to this. And Michael would set up not one, but two boiler room scams of his own in South Florida. And by 2002, he had pocketed $155,000 of stolen money. However, he had spent virtually all of it on fancy hotels and cars and phone sex. But the good times would not last for Michael because in 2002, the police caught on to Michael's boiler room scams and they raided them and Michael was arrested for a third time, except this time he would go to court, he would stand trial, and he would be sentenced to two years in prison, 28 years of probation, and he would be ordered to pay back the $155,000 that he stole. Michael would only serve seven months of his two-year jail sentence, but that was more than enough to leave a huge impact on him. Michael hated prison. He hated every second of it. And so during those long sleepless nights that he was laying awake in his cell, he made a promise to himself that when he got out, when he was released, he would never ever come back. And so in 2003, when he was released, he immediately entered a sobriety program. He also started going to the gym every morning and he began studying for his GED, which is a high school equivalency test because he didn't get his high school diploma. After he successfully earned his GED a couple of months later, he would also start a legal business. It was a digital marketing firm that was called Mad Money Inc. Over the next several years, Michael would do his very best to stay on the straight and narrow and not get in trouble. And for the most part, he did that. By 2008, Michael was still sober, despite a few setbacks, and he was still very focused on his physical fitness and his health, and his business, Mad Money, was doing quite well, earning him nearly $100,000 a year. But his love life had become a bit messy. Michael had gotten married back in 2007 to his longtime girlfriend named Maria Luongo, who had stood by him when he went to jail. But that year, in 2008, when Michael was 38 years old, he cheated on Maria with a 26-year-old real estate agent named Dahlia Mohammed, who he met at a Starbucks. And instead of their affair being a quick fling, as they likely both intended it to be, Michael and Dahlia quickly fell in love. And when that happened, Michael went to his wife Maria and he told her, and then he divorced her. Just three days after the divorce finalized, Michael and Dahlia went to the courthouse and they got married. The newlyweds would move into a brand new condo that Michael had purchased 
purchase for them in Boynton Beach, which is a beautiful town in South Florida. And for a time, their life was perfect. They knew it was a little outrageous the way they had met each other and how quickly they had fallen for each other, but they didn't care. They got along great and they were excited about the future. But their perfect life would not last long. On the evening of March 12th, 2009, so only about a month after they had gotten married, Michael and Dahlia were at home in their condo when they heard a knock on the front door. And so Michael went to the door, he opened it up, and much to his surprise, standing on the other side was his probation officer, and behind him was a whole bunch of police officers. And before Michael could even ask what was going on, the probation officer told Michael that they had received an anonymous call tipping them off that Michael was selling steroids and ecstasy pills and other drugs out of his condo. Michael would tell the probation officer that there was no way that was true. He is not selling any drugs, he's sober, he's not doing that. And so eventually Michael just stepped aside and said, please come in, search my condo. I have nothing to hide. And so sure enough, the police, they would go into his condo, they would search it, but they wouldn't find anything and they would leave. And so after the police had gone, Michael and Dahlia found themselves just standing in their condo, completely dumbfounded. But instead of trying to get to the bottom of it right then and there about who had called and why, they just decided it was best for them to just leave their condo for the night and go stay at a nice hotel. And so they packed up some bags, they left their condo, which was a total mess from the police search, and they went to the hotel and they had a nice night together. The next morning, when they got up and headed down to the parking lot, they saw up ahead, standing around Michael's car, was Michael's probation officer, as well as several other police officers. And so Michael and Dahlia are looking at each other like, what is this, again? And so they hustle on over to Michael's car, and before they can even plead their innocence to Michael's probation officer, he stops Michael and just says, look, we got another anonymous call, this time telling us that you are selling drugs out of your vehicle, and so we need to search it. And so Michael is just totally beside himself, but he says, look, go ahead, search it, there's nothing in the car. And so sure enough, the police would open up his car, they'd rip it apart, but again, they wouldn't find anything. Over the next couple of weeks, the only thing Michael and Dahlia ever wanted to talk about was what the heck was going on. Who is placing these anonymous calls claiming that Michael was selling drugs out of the condo and out of the car? It just didn't add up. They wanted to believe that this was all just one big mistake, but in the back of both of their minds, they were thinking about Michael's very checkered past and his previous dealings with the mafia and with people he had clearly ripped off. And so maybe there was someone in his past that was looking to get back at Michael and maybe get him arrested and sent back to jail. Fast forward to March 29th, so 17 days after that first raid on their condo, and that night, Michael and Dolly had been eating dinner at a restaurant, and when they left and headed out to the parking lot, once again, standing around Michael's car, were several police officers clearly waiting for him to return. And so without even needing to ask why they were there, Michael and Dahlia, they go over to them, and they just start pleading with them to understand that this is a setup. We do not have drugs in this car. We don't know what's going on here. Please, you gotta understand that someone's doing this to us. But this time, when they searched his car, they would find something. After searching Michael's car, the police would find a small bag of cocaine stuck inside of a cigarette carton 
tucked underneath his spare tire in the trunk. And when Michael saw them pull the cocaine out, he began to cry because he knew even though it was not his and he had not put it there, that he was going to jail because he was going to get arrested for possession and he was on probation and he was screwed. And so he just begins crying and pleading with police to understand that the cocaine was not his. He swears it's not his. Meanwhile, Dahlia, you know, she's looking at the drugs and now she's second guessing herself. You know, is Michael lying? Is he actually selling drugs and he's been lying to me too? But when she sees her husband crying hysterically and looking so sincere, she believes that he's got to be telling the truth. And so pretty soon she was standing beside Michael and pleading with police as well to let them go, that this was totally just a setup. And amazingly, these police officers who were aware of the previous raids on Michael and Dahlia's property, they told them, look, we do think this is pretty suspicious that somebody keeps calling in about you selling drugs and now magically the drugs are in your car. And so what we're going to do is we're going to confiscate this cocaine. We're not going to arrest you. Instead, go home, be safe. Call us if you see anything strange, you hear anything strange, and we're going to begin investigating to figure out who is making all of these calls. And so Michael and Dahlia were totally relieved to hear this, but at the same time, they were kind of terrified because clearly whoever was looking to get Michael in trouble now was prepared to break into his property in order to do it. And so what was stopping them from breaking into their condo and planting drugs in there as well? And so after these police officers left, Michael and Dahlia hopped in the car, they sped back to their condo and they went inside and they searched it top to bottom looking for any sign that anyone had recently been in there or if there were drugs or anything illegal inside of their condo. And after looking and finding nothing, they just locked their doors, shut their windows, shut the blinds and just prayed that the police would be able to quickly identify who was doing this to them and make them stop. But over the next few months, the police would not figure out who this anonymous caller was because the caller stopped calling. And so for a little while, Michael and Dahlia were convinced that the whole ordeal was over and done with, and they basically returned to their normal lives. But on August 5th, 2009, roughly four months after the cocaine was found in Michael's car, the anonymous caller would come back with a vengeance. On that morning at around 5.45 a.m., Dahlia left the condo leaving Michael in bed, and she headed out to the local gym to get a workout in. Around 6.30 in the morning, she stepped off the treadmill and she looked at her phone and she saw she had a missed call from a number she didn't recognize, and this number had left her a voicemail. And so she calls her voicemail, she puts it to her ear, and as she's listening, her heart starts to race because it was a Boynton Beach detective telling her there had been some sort of incident at her condo and she needed to come back right away. Terrified, Dahlia grabbed her things and she ran out of the gym, she got in her car, and she called this number back. And when the detective picked up, she tried to get more information from him about what this incident was, you know, what happened. And the detective would only say that it involved her husband and he would explain everything when she came back. And so in a total state of shock, Dahlia turned on her car and she sped out of the parking lot and she headed back towards her condo. And when she turned onto her street and saw her condo, she hit the brakes and just stared. In front of her condo were all these police cars with their lights on and police officers were walking around and yellow crime scene tape was lining the outside of her property and inside of the taped off area there were all these crime scene photographers taking pictures of her condo. And so as Dahlia is sitting in her car at the top of the street just staring at this crazy scene she's seeing, one of the Boynton Beach police officers sees her and walks up and after confirming that she was Dahlia DiPolito, he said to her, you know, leave your car here and come with me. And so Dahlia, who knows, obviously something bad has happened, but really doesn't know the extent of it. She puts her car in park, she gets out and she begins walking with this police officer over towards this cluster of three people that are standing right in front of her property. And it would turn out one of them was the detective who had called her on the phone. And so Dahlia is led over and that detective, as soon as he sees Dahlia, he walks over to her and he says to her very matter of factly that someone had called about a disturbance in their condo and she Shots were fired, and unfortunately, her husband, Michael, was dead. Dahlia, who was totally hysterical, was gently led away from her condo into a nearby police car, and they would drive her to the police station where they would sit her down and begin asking her questions about her husband. And they would say to her, look, I know you just found this out, but we got to figure out what could have happened because a killer is on the loose. We need to find this person and stop them. And so at first, the conversation was really just Dahlia crying and the detective kind of calming her down. But eventually, she would tell the detective about the anonymous 
anonymous caller who kept calling the police and claiming Michael was selling drugs and how she and Michael suspected that, you know, probably the anonymous caller was connected to someone from his past, maybe someone from the mafia or maybe one of the victims of his boiler room scam, or it could be any number of other people that Michael had done wrong in the past. And so the detective, he's taking diligent notes and he's listening to Dahlia. And then at some point in a break in the conversation, he says to Dahlia, okay, it's time to get serious. I need to know if you know this guy. And so Dahlia, she was kind of looking down and she looks up confused what he's talking about. And then the door opens and this huge guy in handcuffs walks into the room. Come here, bring this guy in here. Get over here, get over here. You know who this guy is? No. You've never seen him before? I've never seen him before, ever. Do you know her? Put your head up and look at her. Put your head up. I've never seen him. What were you doing coming out of her house? Get him out of here. It would turn out Dahlia was lying. She did know who that guy was. Almost immediately after marrying Michael six months earlier, she had stolen $200,000 from him, but apparently that wasn't enough for her. She needed the rest of Michael's money as well as his condo. And so she had been the anonymous caller. She was the one calling the police and tipping them off that Michael was selling drugs out of the condo and out of his car. She was the one who planted the cocaine in the back of his car because she wanted him to get arrested because he was on probation and he would go back to jail for a really long time. But when her efforts failed and Michael did not get arrested and so did not go back to jail, Dahlia moved on to plan B. She reached out to one of her ex-boyfriends and she asked him, hey, do you know any hitmen that could murder my husband? And the ex-boyfriend at first didn't think she was serious, but when she kept asking him about it and began offering to pay and really was making it clear that she wasn't joking around, the ex-boyfriend basically told her, no, I don't know any hitmen. And then he, the ex-boyfriend, called the Boynton Beach Police Department and told them about Dahlia and her plan to hire a hitman to kill Michael. And so when the Boynton Beach Police Department found out about this plot, they immediately had one of their undercover agents pose as a hitman and set up a meeting with Dahlia. And so the undercover agent was that huge guy in handcuffs that was led into the room with Dahlia. And so Dahlia goes to meet the undercover agent, the fake hitman. She gets into his car and there's a hidden camera in the back seat that's filming her the whole time. And she's caught on camera saying she wants to kill her husband. She gives money to the undercover cover agent. And then as she's about to get out, the agent turns to her and he says, are you sure you want to do this? Because as soon as you leave, it's done. I am going to kill Michael and you can't stop it. This is Dahlia's reaction. There's no changing. No, there's no like, I'm determined exactly. already. I'm positive, like 5,000% Charlotte. No, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Like as soon as he told me I was going to need the money from you, I went, I grabbed it right away. Like we were good to go. Like with me, you're not going to have a problem. You're not going to have an issue. And so the Boynton Beach Police Department, they have all this information about what Dahlia thinks is going to happen. And they decide they can use this information to set her up in the most elaborate way possible. And it just so happened the very popular true crime TV show, Cops, was filming in the area. And so the Boynton Beach Police Department allowed cops to be a part of this elaborate setup. So they got to film everything that happened. So on the morning of August 5th, Dahlia got up and left her condo at 5.45 a.m. and headed to the gym, knowing, at least in her mind, that the hitman would be coming to her condo right after her, breaking in and shooting her husband twice in the head, because that was the plan they had come up with that was captured on film. And so after the police see her leave at 5.45 a.m., because they were monitoring the condo, they rushed in, they knocked on the door, and they got Michael to come downstairs. And he had no idea his wife was trying to kill him. And so he comes to the door, he's totally confused, but he goes with them and he's kind of ushered off to the police station. And then for about the next hour, the police set up a very convincing fake crime scene right out front of the condo. And then once it was all set up, that detective called Dahlia and left her a voicemail saying that, you know, there's been this incident, you need to come back to your condo. And then a couple of minutes later, when Dahlia called them back and said, okay, I'm coming back to the condo now, that's when the TV crews for the cops TV show, they kind of set up in the bushes and got ready to film what happened next. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, ma'am, he's been killed. No, 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 no. He's, 
He's been killed, man. I'm sorry. No, no, he's not. Listen. No, no. Try to calm down. No, Listen, no. right now what no. we do, we need to get you to the station. No. We need to get you to our police station. No. I, we, I can't let you stand, man. We have to do our job. No. After the fake hitman was pulled out of the interrogation room after Dahlia had said, oh, I don't know who he is, the detective just stared at her in total silence for a minute. And then he broke the news that he totally knew all about her murder plot and that she was going to jail. You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? What do you want to do here? I didn't Dahlia? do anything. Listen to me. I didn't do anything. You're going to I jail. I didn't do anything. Please, I didn't do anything. Don't tell me you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail today. As soon as I'm done, oh they're going to come in here and handcuff you and take you to the Palm Beach County Jail, book you for solicitation of first-degree murder on your husband. Your husband is well and alive. Thank God. Oh, yeah, thank God. Can I see him? No, he doesn't want to see you. I'm so to see him. He doesn't want to see you. After Dahlia was arrested, she was still sitting in that interrogation room when the Boynton Beach Police Department made a special point of walking Dahlia's husband, Michael, past the open door so she could see him. Here's her reaction. Oh my God. He's alive. Come here, please. Come here. Mike, come here. Come here, please. Come here. Why not? I didn't do anything to you. Mike, come here, please. Come here. Okay. Like, can we take it back to booking, please? 